good. Well, good morning. It's uh, uh, good morning. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's nice to be with you today. Um, some of you, uh, maybe I could ask for a show of hands. Anybody who doesn't know who I am, be, be or doesn't know much about me. That's uh, Tim Thompson. Thanks, Tim. Yes, that's very good. Well, um, uh, just for those who don't know, I am. Um, I used to. Oh, I go to this. Is my home church. Even though some of you won't know who I am, I'm out most Sundays. I speak for compassion around Scotland and the north of England. I'm out, I think, 35, 36 Sundays a year, and uh, I don't get to come here that often. Hi, Zara. Hi. But it's so great to be here. Um, I have uh, uh, one wife <laughs> and, uh, um, and one dog. I love my dog. I really do love my dog. <laughs> Um, and three, three daughters and four grandchildren. And when our youngest daughter, I think I've told this story, some of you might remember this, but when my youngest daughter got married, I married her on the shores of Loch Lomond, believe it or not. And then we got home after she wasn't at home, and I said to Muriel, we've got no more girls in the house. We need to get another girl. So we got a dog. And it was, uh, her name's Jess, and I don't know why I'm telling you that, but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, my wife says, that when I'm not there, she tells Jess everything. I thought, well, it's just a dog, but um, obviously good therapy for. But um, that's our life. I'm out. I meet pastors most days of the week. I go around Scotland uh, just building relationships with good men of God. And, uh, and then they ask me to come and speak at their churches on a Sunday. Um, and it's one of the greatest things I've ever done. I, was uh, a leader in this church at 18 years of age. I'm 65, and I did it for a number of years. And as a blessing as that was for me, um, going around churches advocating on behalf of children in poverty has been one of the most rewarding uh, kind of swan songs of my, of my life, really. Uh, there are over 360 million children in adverse poverty. Now, 360 million is a figure that just goes over my head, and I'm sure it goes over yours. But as I said uh, to people uh, most Sundays, it's, today it's about one child. Aaron mentioned that. It's about the one. It's about changing the life of a child. And I have the privilege of coming to churches and, and really compelling people to think about changing a life. Uh, and I've got 14 children at the back there whose lives would be enriched, and they would thrive through through probably an investment of around about a pound a day. I always use the illustration of a, a Costa coffee or a Starbucks, and I kind of get two or three of those a week. And uh, you know, if I were to sacrifice and not take too many Costa coffees, I could probably change a life. And that's, that's the truth of what we do at Compassion. But maybe just before I do start, and I'll not go on too long, I promise you, um, there's a little video, maybe Kate, you could put up, um, which is about um, some children who have grown up and they're just thanking God for the relationships they had. They're now graduates, they're older, but they've all been sponsored children. So it's only about a minute and a half. Can we run that? Thank you. sponsor had a great impact on me on my development because every time I go to school every time I do something I always think of them and I always make them proud yes I always want to make my parents proud too but there's another set of parents that I consider that I don't want to disappoint them I see my sponsors Betty and Boyd as as my family because uh, that's how they treated me. They treated me as one of their sons. The first person that helped me believe that I could be a leader was my sponsor, who wrote me that letter and told me that they believed in me. And I thought to myself, if they believed in me and I was going to become somebody, it's true. I can actually become that somebody. 
and they always encourage me just to be a good student, a good daughter, and just to keep learning as much as I could because even though in my thoughts that maybe I would not be able to do much because I didn't have the resources, but they always put those words in my heart that I will have just a trust in God that He will He will He will open doors for me. I am what I am today because of a stranger willing to invest in my life and show me the, the love of Christ and pray for me and encourage me each step of the way. Of that simple uh, line that you said at the end there, uh, his life changed because a stranger invested in his life. And uh, I really want to do two things this morning, if I, if I may. One is to really thank you on behalf of Compassion. Most of you know Compassion. This is a Compassion church. We've been sponsoring kids uh, as, as a church probably for 25 years. I mean, it's been incredible. I think through the time we've seen 55 children um, kind of released from poverty. Uh, right now, there are 36 children that are sponsored by people uh, either who, who are not in the church anymore or are in the church here. And that continues to happen. And, and I can't thank you enough because we need to take a moment just to, not to think about a number, but to think about a life, like I said, and to think that the, the investment, uh, prayerfully, kind of letter writing and financial support doesn't just change a child's life, it changes a family. Um, it, it changes a community. And I always use this story of you know, skimming a stone across uh, the water, uh, that ripple effect. Um, and that's how compassion works. It doesn't affect just the child. Uh, it brings uh, hope to that child who's in poverty. And Aaron mentioned poverty and hope earlier on. And, and just let me say that poverty is not just about not having a meal tomorrow. Poverty is a way of life. It's, it's, a, it's a state of mind. It's about not knowing if there is a tomorrow. And that can apply to people in our streets, in our, in our communities, in our families that don't know Jesus. They're, in a sense, spiritually uh, in poverty. And, uh, and, and we're in light. And, and I also want to encourage you today with a couple of scriptures just to make us realize actually what we can do with this life that God has put inside of each one of us. See, the world is changing and... You know, we can, we can say that the church in one sense is on, in decline, you know, numbers-wise, but the message hasn't changed, the message of Jesus. And the needs of people haven't changed. So we've got to think about what can we do as God's people to, to, to impact change in, in the world in which we live. But let me just give you a couple of stats, if I may. And Kate, if this doesn't work, you can maybe help me. So, um, oh, that's great. Yeah, so... It's incredible to think, these are just figures, but they're because people have made a decision to invest in these children's lives. So of the children that are sponsored at Compact, 23,473 hours have been spent in projects. Now what happens with the projects are, these children are funded by what we do, by sponsorship, to go to school, but on a Friday they go to the project. And that project is like coming to church. And um, when they come to church, they get, taught all about life skills and, and uh, they talk about, taught about Jesus. Many of them don't even know Jesus and many of them make a profession of faith. Many of them are Muslim. And they go to, their parents know they go into a Christian church and then these kids get saved and then the kids witness to the parents and the parents get saved. I mean, that happens. I think it was 2017, 360,000 children in Compassion Projects gave their heart to the Lord. I mean, that's just amazing. So, you know, it's, it's about Jesus. It's Jesus-centered. But that's the hours that spent in the project. They've had that number of meals, uh, medical checks, and, and, and Bibles. So there's a real emphasis on equipping these children. You know that old adage that says we can catch a fish and have a meal for a day, or we can teach someone to fish and they can feed themselves for a lifetime. And that's, that's the sort of philosophy, if you like, of, of compassion. Um, this is a great statistic. Um, in the last 12 months, as a church, we have invested over 16 and a half thousand pounds into children in poverty. And 
That's incredible. It's an incredible figure. It's an incredible investment. And I, I always see it as an investment because um, when, I, when I think about you know, financial investment, people look for a return. People go and buy stocks and shares and they're looking for a return. There's no greater return than to sow into the life of, of a family, a child in poverty, and see that life thrive. I mean, who does not want to see children released from poverty? And uh, that's amazing. And it says 17 additional gifts. Um, children have sent over 127 letters. Letter writing is so vitally important as part of what we do. That, that relationship building, it works. Um, we've only sent 36 letters. <laughs> Bad boys and girls. Um, so that's, that's kind of one letter per child, per, uh, per person. But the letters are so important. I could talk all morning about uh, what it's like for a child to, to, to not get a letter <laughs> and make you feel bad. Uh, but I won't do that. But letters, are, they're, they're really important. And uh, that adds up to that number of uh, ages, primary, secondary, and adult. And that's their faces. Now, when I go to churches, I, people start, oh, look, it's my sponsor child. And just, just look at those lives. And, and there's 36 children up there. And um, just look at them for a moment and just realize that, you know, if you've made that decision in the past to sponsor a child, um, then it's, um, that's why that child's up there. And if you made the decision today to sponsor a child, uh, if Aaron has me back, um, that child's face will be up on that screen. But these just represent not just individuals, they represent families, and, and importantly, they represent communities. And uh, Aaron's been out to the field. Um, I've been out a number of times, and uh, it can't, it cannot in any way underestimate the impact of what we do by that act of kindness. And, uh, but not everyone feels that way, and that, that's fine. Not everybody wants to sponsor a child, but the, the challenge today for me is to, is to stir your hearts afresh, if I can, through the Word. And, uh, um, and don't see this um, in any way going to bash you with, with the Scriptures. I'm not doing that. I'm just, all I want to do today, and, and I kind of do this wherever I go, um, is really encourage the church t- to realize that we've got everything that we need to be able to make a difference in someone's life. Let me say that again. We've got everything in here that we need and in our wallets, but everything in here to impact those that are in poverty today. Whether that's poverty in our streets, as I say, whether it's somebody who's going through a difficult time and doesn't know Jesus, they are in in effect in poverty. So let me read to you, if I may, from um, uh, the book of Luke, a passage that kind of we all know, but just imagine you've never heard it before and I love this story because <clears throat> it, um, it really does speak to me about um, about what it means to have compassion so it says here in Luke 10 it's the parable of the good Samaritan how many people know that story well I assume you all do or well, most of you do but let me read it to you afresh it says on one occasion an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus teacher he asked what must I do to inherit eternal life Jesus said, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? And he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Aaron read that earlier. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is really important for, for, for the church. You have answered correctly, Jesus said to the, to the, to the scholar, to the expert. Do this and you will live. That's what he said. Now do this and you will live. The fulfillment of that in your life means that your life will be fulfilled. Do this and you shall live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus this. And who is my neighbor? This is a great question. Who is my who is my neighbor? We're told to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And and, and intertwined in that is loving those that aren't being loved today. And um, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied in verse 30, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, 
and went away leaving him for dead. Now just to visualize this, it was one of the most notorious roads uh, in, in that area. It says, um, a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, this is a priest, when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, another man of God, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Then verse 33 says, but a Samaritan, who was a kind of enemy of the, the man that had been attacked of the Jew, one that you wouldn't expect to stop, it says, as he traveled, he came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him, or he had compassion for him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. Verse 35 says, the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra expense you may have had. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? The expert of the law said, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Be like the, the Samaritan. And this is a beautiful illustration, I believe, of, of the state of our world today, of, of, of mankind, of how, we, how people respond to, the, to, to, to those that are in need. You've got, first of all, the, the robbers. Well, they didn't have a conscience. Okay, they, they, you know, they, they, they just did what they wanted to do. They didn't think of the consequences of what they did. And that's a little bit like people in the world today that are in sin. You know, their sins hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. What they want, they just take. They don't consider about, um, about giving to others. They just want to take, take, take. And they don't care about the, the consequences. And how many people live their life like that? So the robber represents a kind of person, maybe those kind of people, some of them go to church. I don't know, but there's not an ounce of a sense of, of, of compassion for somebody. In, in fact, they just want to take take, take. And then you've got the priest and the Levite. And I, this is a great account, really, of, dare I say, some Christians that I know. <laughs> and I'm sure it's none of you here. would never apply to you. But there are just some people, it says, these religious men who should have known better were too busy. They were too busy doing religion. You know, they, this man was lying on the side of the street. And metaphorically, we have people lying on the side of, our, of the street in, in this nation, in the nations that we work in with compassion, 29 countries, developing countries. We, we have these needs, and yet I come across many Christians are just too busy. I won't even begin to tell you, I think it was you sent me here in a great little YouTube clip of all the different ways some Christians say no. And it was all things like, you know, the Lord's not led me, or I, mean, I can't even begin to say it, but it kind of spoke to me about the Levite and the priest. They were too busy to help this man that was destitute. And God, deliver us from that, folks. Deliver us from indifference. Deliver us from being so busy that we can't see the needs of people that are right in front of us. And like I say, I'm not just talking about children in adverse poverty. I'm talking about people in our communities that are in need today. That's, that's the challenge for, for each one of us. Anyway, the third person was the Samaritan, and he kind of represents a Jesus figure for me. He, he just he canceled his schedule. He was a busy guy, probably the busiest legitimately, but he stopped, it said, and he tended to the needs of that man. And, and what a great example. He was busy, but he demonstrated compassion. He looked upon the man and he had great pity for him. And, 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 and that's the heart I believe that God wants for the church, the heart of compassion. Well, what is compassion? Well, I, I, I believe it's a, an overwhelming uh, sense that comes from the bottom of our heart, that almost a pain that we can't um, satisfy because we've been called as, as followers of Jesus to, to, 
to, to kind of give it away what God has given us. I was uh, not that long ago in Uganda, and um, um, we went to one of the, the kind of shanty towns there, and we met this young girl. She must have been 16, 17, and she'd been raped, and she had a baby. And, and I, I can't even begin to describe her accommodation for you. I mean, she, somebody had, had acted kindly and gave her this, this is not as big as my shed in my garden. It was just this kind of shed. And there was no bed. There was just blankets that she slept on with her baby. And she was outcast from the community because she'd been raped. And I tell you this story because I, I had a real kind of moment there because I, I at first I was just numb with it and I, and I thought God I, I, I need to feel something here I need to be moved with compassion for this for this girl I, I, I can't why am I here Lord and it was a it was one of those moments where you're faced with a decision not just a decision to give her a loaf of bread but to 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 be changed by it and uh, and I remember just praying and, and I imagined that this child was one of my children my girls are older than that, but even I have a 12 year old granddaughter. So, but at the time, I, I just thought of, of my youngest daughter and I thought, and imagine that the baby was my grandchild. And honestly, folks, I just began to ache. I, I, I was just, uh, oh, and I thought, that's what God wants the church to be like. He wants us to almost be in pain until we, in some way, give this away. And we'll talk about what giving it, it is. But, um, it changed my whole thinking. It changed my mind because I thought, I felt helpless when I saw this girl. We bought her groceries. We gave her two or three bags of groceries, which would have got her by for a few days. But, but what was God teaching me? Well, he, he was teaching me that if the church, if we could ache for the world that we live in, then we'll see all our seats filled. We'll see our churches overflowing because we're taking this message that, that God's placed in each one of our hearts, this, this ache, if you like, and, and we're pouring it, we're investing into the life of somebody else. You see, when we sponsor a child, or when we, when we, we speak about Jesus to somebody, it's not just words or actions. It's actually, it's living. Something's happening. It's... it's it's surrendering all that we are, and it's, it's giving it all away. Think of the story of the, I think it's in, in the book of Mark, uh, the rich young uh, ruler. Yeah, Mark 10. He said to Jesus, what must I do to, enter, uh, to, to, to inherit the kingdom of heaven? He says, I honor my mother and father. Uh, I, I don't commit adultery. You know, I, I don't steal. I don't do this. And, and Jesus said, oh, well done, son. Well done. Great. But only one thing you lack. Give all that you have, turn it into money and give it to the poor. You, Jesus wanted his heart. And the great last verses uh, on that passage, when Jesus said that to him, he said, the man's face fell. And he went away because he had great wealth. And all Jesus wanted was this man to say, look, none of this matters compared to to knowing Jesus. Nothing really matters. This wealth is, is, is nothing to me. But he kept all the commandments. He'd obeyed his mother and father. But Jesus just looked through him with wisdom. And I always tell that story that, that you know, the disciples were there and uh, they probably were saying, look, Jesus, just, just take half his money. Let him keep half of it. We'll be doing okay. Lord, why are you asking to sell everything he has to give to the poor? But just Jesus wanted his heart. That's all he... And he wants our heart. He wants the hearts that are, are willing to be uh, surrendered uh, for him. And that's my challenge for you today, folks. That we've got a, a, a nation that are crying out for hope and for the words of Jesus in our lives. And, and it's up to us. And I, I'm, I'm sorry if you've heard me say that before, if you've heard it before, but there's only one message, and that is the message of Jesus, which each one of us have. And whenever I speak to somebody about Jesus, whenever I in, in some way invest in somebody, with, whether it's a prayer or whether it's a gift or whether it's, uh, whether it's um, you know, some kind action, I have to believe, and, and hear me here, 
that I am sowing into, I'm investing into that person's salvation. I always believe that, that everybody, everybody that we know that doesn't know Jesus is on a journey from maybe the first time they've heard about Jesus, you know, that, that time of conception. It's like a gestation period between conception and new birth. Now, you know, new birth for, for, for a human, for physically, is nine months. But for a lot of people that we might know that we think, well, why haven't they come to know Jesus yet? They might be on this journey between conception and new birth. And when we sow into that in some way, when we pray into that and we, 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 we give some kind act of kindness, we're just helping nudging that process along to new birth. We have to believe that. I was speaking to a pastor up in Inverness just recently, and he said, you know, Adrian, I'm just, I just feel we've done so much outreach, and I'm, I'm discouraged, and we're not seeing souls saved. And I just I said, look, you know, I'm not in your position. It's not an easy time for the church, but, but you need to have faith to believe that you're sowing into this gestation period, and that those people that you're praying for and reaching out for and having, you know, outreach events for, they're being nudged along this place from conception to new birth. And he stopped his pastor and started to write it down. He says, what, what, what are you doing? He said, oh, just, that just, you know, I'm so encouraged by what you're saying. I said, but surely you've heard that before. He said, yeah, but I'm hearing it from you today. It's like I've never heard it before. And I, I, I was moved for this guy because he's sowing away. But I said, you're not sowing in vain. And folks, I want to say that to you, that whatever we do, you, we have to trust that, whether it's sponsoring a child today, that we're investing, it's not in vain. These children will thrive. They're waiting. And that's not an emotional thing on you today, but they're waiting for people to come and invest in their lives so they can then invest in other people's lives. There's a passage I just want to finish with and I want to pray. Um, I do love this passage. It's in, in Matthew 5. And... Um, Verse 14 says this, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, verse 16 says in Matthew 5, Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and bring glory to your Father in heaven. And this thing I want to leave you with today is is that you would believe today that you have something in your heart, a DNA of Jesus in your heart, a little bit of Jesus, that if you could take that light, even today, and shine it into some situation, that lives will be changed. Do not underestimate the power of Jesus in your life. It's not your words, it's not your actions, it's the Spirit of God working through you. And I was at church not that long ago, and a lady came up to me and she said, I really feel I've got a prophetic word just to add to what you're saying today. She said, um, the thing about Christians is they, they, they take the light, um, take that light, but they shine it into the light. And it doesn't have, and she said, I thought she was really, actually a lot better than what I preached, she, what she said. And she said, we've been called to shine our light into darkness and the difference between seeing this light like that and seeing it in darkness is really quite profound well it was when we Kate and I tried it earlier <laughs> so you can see that when I bought this, it said it can shine 45 meters, but I don't really see 45 meters on, on that. But the difference of shining that light in darkness, thanks, Kate, that's the Holy Spirit of God in us. Folks, I compel you today to make some decisions. We I want to see this church thriving and growing. We want to see souls coming in here. We want to see new faces. We want to see lives right now that are in poverty be set free but that's up to our acts of obedience and trusting that what God has placed in our hearts his DNA that little bit of Jesus 
if we do reach out in Jesus' name. And by the way, I'm not talking about us kind of being religious about this and, you know, I'm just talking about little acts of kindness, little words of encouragement, prayerfully considering those that are in darkness the day that you know and saying, God, show me a way to nudge this person on from that place of conception to new birth. Help me, help me see where they're at so that my words and my actions and my life would bring about salvation. That's what we want. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus in our lives. Thank you for the hope that you've put within each one of us. Thank you that you, that you rescued each one of us here today. There was a day that we walked in darkness. But you rescued us. Father, we just want to say thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the hope you've placed within our lives that we've been given that second chance and that we have our destiny secure in Jesus. Challenge each one of us, Lord, to take that light that you've placed within us, to be like the good Samaritan, as it were, to stop and say, well, I'm not too busy to do this. Or to be like the rich young ruler had he responded to Jesus and said, yes, this stuff doesn't matter. It's just about Jesus. And gave it all away. Help us be the men and women of God who would raise our hands and say, Lord, here I am, send me. Father, we pray for these children at the back from uh, Laganoff and Haiti that, God, if you speak to us about changing their life today, that we would respond and help them begin that journey. Or you bring another face or another person to our, our, our minds right now that we know that are in darkness through not knowing you today, Lord. I pray you would help us take the next steps in that gestation period that they may come to know Jesus, the Savior and Lord. Help us do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Adrian, take a wee seat. We're just going to, uh, I've just got a few questions for Adrian. Um, could you, Kate, just put up that um, photograph, please? This was, we've, I've had the privilege, have a seat, Adrian. I've had the privilege of um, being in Haiti. This was a good number of years ago. And this is a little girl called Enajin. And she was one of our uh, compassion children. And uh, I had the privilege of being able to go into her house and to play Uno with no translator with her mum and dad and um, 13 children. And uh, that was a good number of years ago. But as Adrian said, it was the size of my garage. They had two double beds and the poverty. I asked the father, what does he do for work? He climbs up a mountain with a sledgehammer, breaks big rocks into small rocks all day for 12 hours, and then tries to sell the small rocks. And I was like, how, how is that? And he's like, oh, that's terrible on the joints. And you just get this understanding of real poverty. When, in fact, we were doing medical clinics, and this little girl was running about, and her hair was orange, uh, which means vitamin deficiency, malnourishment, because her hair should be jet black. And they said, is, we need to find a sponsor for this little girl. Look how, how malnourished she is. And um, I had the privilege of being able to become one of our family's sponsored children. And uh, a few months back, um, she sent a little video for my mother's birthday. I'd asked her if she could sing a song for my mother's birthday. So I don't know if you've got that, Kate. If you could just, uh, this is her now today. Happy birthday to you. 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 My mother. God bless you. God bless you. I love you. So there she is. And uh, it's just wonderful, as Adrian was saying, to look at then and now and the difference. And uh, it's just great to see her in health. Um, if you currently sponsor a child, um, 
I'm, I'm just going to ask Adrian, could you just expl explain what is the Compassion app? And uh, one, one of the things you can do on there, um, well, actually, I'll ask Adrian that. What is the Compassion app and what's two or three of the main things you can do on that? Yeah, the app uh, really eliminates the excuses that so many people uh, give me where they don't write letters to their sponsored children. I was did this event in Princess Street Garden a few years ago. It's called Life and Soul or Heart and Soul. And we had a, a, a stand there, just a, an awareness of compassion. And throughout the day, more than 15 ladies, no men, came up to me to ask me for forgiveness for not writing to their sponsored child. And I said to them, no, I'm not giving you forgiveness. And I said, if you promise me you're going to go home tonight and write, I will give you absolution. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, get the app. And they said, oh, what app? So we have an app when you sponsor a child. If you're already sponsoring and you don't have that, you can contact the office and they will set you up. But if you sponsor today, you'll automatically get uh, your account set up. So the app allows us to write letters. My, even my wife, Muro, writes these messages so we write three four five times a year because you can just write a few lines and remember about letter writing is it's not like we would expect letters to be you know what people say what, we, what am I going to say well tell them you pray for them you love them tell them about your family don't tell them about your new car and they wouldn't really understand that but it just has to be a few sentences and the app also tells you uh, about where the, the sponsored child lives and how things are there. You'll get updates and reports. And uh, it allows you to send, if you want to send a birthday gift or a Christmas gift, you can do it through the app. It's so easy and so good. And then we, my wife and I sponsor a number of children, and they're all on the app. So we, we see their progress and the photographs of them as they're getting older. So the app is, is, is great. Probably won't be able to see that, but this is one of our children on the app. And um, one of the other things that you can do on the app is you can send, a, well, as Adrian said, you can send a family gift. And my encouragement to myself and to us all is, you know, if you consider the average income of some of these families can be, what, Adrian, $30 to $50 per month, maybe, you know. You know, and I think you're allowed to give a family gift up to how much per year is it? I wouldn't necessarily always recommend giving, it's always better to give smaller multiples on a regular basis than large amounts, um, you know, in, infrequently. So I always tell people when asked, you know, 10 or 20 pounds, um, uh, unless there are particular needs of the family that you know about. Um, there was one child where we sponsored a child and they had a profoundly disabled son, and we sent them a little bit more money because we wanted to help that child who's not in the program. Um, but, but you can send up to 100. Uh, you can send more, but not through the app. So. Yeah, and, and it just, you know, if you consider, like as Adrian was saying, that, you know, what's 20 quid to us, you know, on top of your sponsorship, it, it, it's nothing, but it can really uh, be a, a, a big help. Um, you know, how much is it per month at the moment, Adrian, to sponsor a child? It's, uh, it's, just, it's just over a, a pound a day. It's 32 pounds a month. 32 pounds a month. And so some of you are already sponsoring children or some of you are not in the position. I think one of the things I'm passionate about from my own life is that, you know, God wants us to have a good financial plan in place. And one of the things that we want to have in our financial plan or budget or whatever you want to call it is... Um, prioritizing God and generosity. And as we looked earlier, when you give to the poor, you're giving to God. Um, so I wholeheartedly believe, you know, um, you know, when you're given to compassion, that you're giving to God. <laughs> and how can I say that? Well, Jesus said, when you give a cup of water to one of these in my name, you give it unto me. Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. So that's my scriptural, theological um, backbone and uh, stands for that. And so literally is, I believe, investing in the kingdom of heaven. And some charities, and as many of you know this, but some charities, you know, take 50% of your money and use it on administration and expense season. I mean, if you look at church uh, budgets, a lot more of that is spent on administration and bills and all the rest of it. But how much pennies in the pound actually goes to the child, Adrian? 
Um, we're one of the highest in the UK. Um, uh, it's, it's a minimum of, of 80 pence of the, in the pound, 80%. So 20% goes towards salaries for staff and uh, obviously trying to promote compassion to keep the awareness of the organization and the running costs of it. But um, it, it's, there are charities that, whose names we would know that are under 50% goes to the, the cause. But compassion, I think, is in the top escalon of, of 80-something percent, bro. Yeah, and I, I've, I've got a little challenge for you, and I, I, I just want to put this out there to you, um, because I think we have to speak on behalf of those who have no voice. Um, we have to be brave, we have to be bold, we have to be courageous. And I think I would like to charge all of us to consider Number one, if you don't sponsor a child, could you sponsor a child? Number two, if you can't financially afford that just now, could you start to put in place a financial plan so that you can get there at some point? And if you need help with that, Christians Against Poverty have a um, money management course over three nights. I've summarized it into a 30-minute video. Um, I'll make that available. Um, but could you become a compassion sales rep? And what I mean by that, if you currently sponsor a child, could you become the voice of compassion? Could you aim to find one of your friends or family members to try and sponsor a child in the next three months? Do you think that is possible? And if it is, what would you need to do to make that happen? So just have a wee think about it. Just have a think about, Adrian's gonna say a wee word, um, a just funny story just comes to mind. I was speaking at a church down in the borders, and uh, it, it, this girl came up to me. She, she, I think she stayed in like sheltered accommodation. She was a former addict, and uh, she was on benefit. And she said, I, I, I feel so convicted by what you've said today. Uh, it's always been about me, she said, and invest in me. I want to I take some responsibility for somebody else. I want to sponsor a child. And I said to her, I don't think I can let you sponsor a child today. Uh, why not? I said, because I, I, make it, I made a call that she wasn't in a financial position to do that. I said, I don't think it's fair on you. I really do. You could pray for the organization. No, I want to sponsor a child. I said, well, look, if you could find somebody else. We don't do this very often, but we do it when somebody wants to, but they can't. If you could find somebody else to sponsor with you, you could maybe do it together. So um, she stormed off. I thought, I've really offended her. And uh, she went away, and then about 20 minutes later, she comes back with this, like this, with this girl, dragging this girl who wasn't even a church, wasn't a Christian. It, she got her out of the sheltered uh, accommodation, and she'd spoken to her all the way back. She's going to do it with me. <laughs> and I thought, I bet that woman's a Christian today. She wasn't a believer. And I said, okay, if the two of you are going to do it, I'll let you do it. And they went away. Even this non-Christian girl was like just buzzing. That's powerful. Yeah, wonderful. And, and so, yeah, wholeheartedly, I really believe each one of us have got a friend or family member that would like to do this. Why do I believe that? It's because I believe all humans were created in the image and likeness of God. So deep within us is a desire to help poverty. And you can give someone that opportunity. And so I just want to put that out there to you. Have a think, what would it take it maybe means sharing on your social media feeds some of your photos of your child. Um, and I did this once, and uh, you know, I just sh shared a photo. It's so great to sponsor with compassion. Here's one of our children. Here's blah, 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 blah. Um, if you would like to you know, uh, help. And I, I, someone did comment, and I was able to message them directly. So I put that out there to you. Could you do that? Maybe you couldn't sponsor another child. Maybe you're not in a financial position. But Compassion has got lots of great media. And one of the things you can do is share it. As Adrian says, by shining the light in the light, it's not really having an impact. So just by liking it. But can you share some of their videos? It's hard for charities, and I see them. They post stuff, and most Christians just flick past. And don't, but, you know, part of getting a heart for God is I can share this, um, whether it's through WhatsApp, whether it's on social media, or through through whatever feeds, um, is, is another wonderful way. And as Adrian said, is to to pray. I'm just going to. Uh, it, it's not recognising my face because of the mic. <laughs> um, okay, wonderful. 
So, Adrian, in the um, hallway, you've got 15 children? 14. 14 children ready to be sponsored today. If you've got questions, oh, the other question that did come to mind, Adrian, now, um, as a business, if you're a business owner or own your own business, um, one of the things that you may already do or would like to do is to um, uh, use some of your income and use it to, to give away, to bless. Is that something businesses can do with Compassion Agent? And have you got businesses that do that? What's a good way for businesses to partner with Compassion to help um, bring children out of poverty in Jesus' name? Uh, I have the privilege of doing a lot of what we call major donor work. So I meet with people um, who have got a lot of money. Um, we have people who say, have said to me, uh, I'll, I'll sponsor 100 kids, but I can't write to them. So we then have volunteers who will write to those children. And so they take on 100 children, 100 kids to, in one project. I mean, they just like take over a project, which is fantastic. But we also have uh, opportunities for uh, organizations to sponsor. One of the m most exciting things that I, I get involved in is a thing called Child Survival Program. And um, what that is, very simply, if I can say it, is that, is that in, in many countries, infant mortality rate is so high, uh, particularly in, in countries in Africa, where ch children are dying at, at birth or mothers are hemorrhaging at birth and dying. Invariably, the oldest lady in the village ends up being the midwife and delivers that baby and if there's complications there's, there's problems so what we've done in a lot of countries particularly I've worked uh, in Togo uh, but it's very high in Togo and so what we do is we try and identify these women and uh, I have uh, donors or churches who maybe want to help 15 mothers and their babies from the time that the mother uh, knows she's pregnant through to when the child's ready to go into sponsorship and we have a health professional um, dedicated to that mother that health professional would look after these 15 women. They get all the pre and postnatal care. She's there at, at the delivery, and uh, she's there teaching them breastfeeding, and all the things that, that, that a mother would need that would get here. And we also teach the mothers a skill. It might be bookkeeping or soap making so that they can create some, some revenue for themselves when that child uh, comes along. And uh, we've seen an incredible uh, turnaround in infant mortality in the projects where we have raised funds. I, I have one church in Glasgow, uh, they wanted to help 30 mothers and babies, and uh, um, I, I went to the church and one of the guys said he wanted to run the London Marathon, and uh, so we, we got him a place in the marathon. He raised 4,500 of the 12 just by running the London, uh, and it was all people at his work that he got to, to, to sponsor him. I, I, I love the child survival program because it, if you have a community, maybe the size of, I don't know, Resyth or, or, or smaller places in Fermland, if you get all the, the mothers that are pregnant in this program, it impacts the whole community. And, uh, and, and, it's, and the people there know it's done in Jesus' name. So, sorry, long. Answer. No, no, I, I, love, I love that, Adrian. I love the child survival program statistically and professionally. That's one of the things I love about this is because it's so professional. But they are literally saving infant life. So the infant mortality rate is significantly reduced, i.e. babies that would have died no longer are dying um, or, you know, are, are in severe sickness or uh, ill health. You know, as a business, imagine one of you, you know, again, I believe that your customers want to know that, that your business is ethical and is making a difference. And there's different ways of doing that. But imagine you could say, for every penny in the pound, this amount of pennies goes to saving the lives of children in such and such a country so that you're not only supporting us by buying a product from us, but your money is literally, and you can say this with confidence, saving babies from dying. There was a, there's a, a business in America, I can't remember what it's called, um, Adrian, is it Tom's Shoes? There's this famous uh, business, and uh, the guy was out visiting, and he was so distressed that these children had no shoes. He went back to America, and he started a shoe shop where for every pair of shoes you buy, they promise to send a pair of shoes to a child in poverty. Um, 
So you not only buy a pair of shoes for yourself, but you're buying a pair of shoes for a child who has no shoes. This business, um, I can't, I must, I'll post it in the group. I think it's called Tom's Shoes. It's not Tom, it, it, you and, is it called Tom's Shoes? Tom's Shoes. And it went, it went massive because you're tapping into the desire that God gave each individual um, created in his image to bring a solution to poverty. And people love that. They get a buzz from that, that I'm not only enjoying my new trainers, I've just bought new trainers. So I just want to ask business owners uh, just to pray and trust the Holy Spirit. But, you know, maybe that's your way of tithing, of giving some of your proceeds as first, putting God first in your business, believing that when you give to the poor, God's going to give back to you. I don't believe every penny has to go into a church building in order to give to God because... Um, Biblically, when you give a cup of water or you save an infant from dying, for me, and biblically, I believe you're giving to God. So that's one wonderful way to do it. 100% tax deductible as well. You sound like a pro, bro. <laughs> 100% tax deductible. Let's just pray. And let's have the band up for one final song. Come on, let's stand, Adrian. Let's just have the band up. Let's stand and pray. Father, we give you thanks for compassion a charity that began in the 1950s, Lord, with one man, Everett Swanson. And today, 2.2, I believe, 2.2 million children, 2.2 million children lifting out of poverty in Jesus' name. We praise you. We thank you. We pray you'll continue to bless the work of compassion. Lord, for all those that work for compassion, would you renew their strength? Would you refresh them? Would you anoint them with wisdom? Would you multiply, Lord, those children and their work, Lord, upon the earth, Heavenly Father? And we ask you today, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each person here today. We wouldn't go home, tuck into our Sunday lunch and go, that was a nice message, and forget what in one ear and out the ear. But Lord, each person here today, whether we sponsor or not, we would know what is it you, what does the Lord require of me? We ask you, Lord, what do you require of me? I.e., what would you love for me to do as a response to the issue of poverty in the globe today? It seems pointless, Lord. It seems too big. But you're, you've reminded us today to help the one in front of us. And maybe that's one of those children sitting on that table out in the foyer today. If there is, stir the hearts today, Lord, we pray. And help us, Lord, to have your heart for compassion, for justice. Help us to walk humbly, to love mercy, and to act justly. May we walk humbly, act justly, and love mercy. In Jesus' name. Let's put our hands together and just thank, thank God for compassion. Thank God for Adrian. Thank you, Adrian, brother. Thank you for the message. Over to the band, just to final song of worship.